Hiya Pickles! Happy New Year! If you are new to my channel, then welcome! I'm Theon Apollo. Today we're going to have a chat about Disney's newest animated film, Encanto, and the many perceptions people have around the themes of the story. More specifically, I want to talk about the way in which people have taken so strongly to the characters of this wonderful film, and how in some ways this can be a fantastic thing, and in other ways not so much. First and foremost, this video is not an attack on anyone. As a queer person, I'm no stranger to imposing queer subtext onto media that I enjoy or in which it seems plausible. We've been starved a bit long enough that it really isn't unreasonable to want that, but something I and a few others have started to notice is that people from our community will use that to overshadow the main points that any given media will have in favour of their own representation or shipping. Which, if you are shipping people from the same family, I am side-eyeing you so hard right now, like what are you doing? That's weird. And a number of people who are actually from Colombia have been expressing concern that this is causing the core themes of the film to be ignored. So let's break that down and talk about it. What I want to do is invite people to not necessarily proclaim that these things are good or bad, because it's a lot more complex than that. Rather, I would like to talk about some aspects of the film that I would like others to appreciate a bit more. And that's all there is to it. But before I do, I just want to give you all a quick PSA on this channel's policies. A small handful of people have been privately asking me about making videos on certain goings on in the art commentary community, specifically the drama side of things. So here's my answer. I am an artist and I want to talk about art. I do not care about other people's terrible behaviour. Okay, that's probably a bit too blunt. Let me elaborate. For now, I don't mind making videos about people who are well known or have a lot of influence, such as showrunners or celebrities and the like, whom I believe I am within my right to call out when they mess things up. It just gets a bit too personal and messy for my liking when you share a platform with the people in the hot seat, and it also seems very risky to run your mouth about it in a video because I don't feel like I have all of the necessary background knowledge as to who these people actually are. I'm still quite new here and I have a bad memory, I get things mixed up, and again, I really just don't care enough anyway. So so because of that, I'm going to keep my mouth shut for now, but I have been watching things from the sidelines and I am choosing to just not fan the flames, basically. If you are brave enough to talk about this, then that's great, I just don't want to. If we want the commentary community to be better, I feel like a broken record when saying this, but we need to start giving our attention to things we actually like, instead of talking about the bad all the time. If I wanted to be depressed about something, I would just watch the news, I'm just saying. I'm a bit too old to be arguing about something on the internet, I'm not gonna lie. With that aside, apologies for the tangent, let's talk about Encanto. Let's begin with the actual premise of the film. I will be going into spoiler territory, so if you don't want the film to be ruined for you, click away now. Encanto is a story about the Magigal family, a family that has been blessed with magical gifts all except for one, our protagonist Mirabel. I did not notice this until I tried to pronounce Magigal, but in English that actually sounds like magical. <laughs> That's pretty cool. After being left to feel like an outcast in her own family one too many times, the Madrigal home, or Casita, begins to show signs of breaking and Luisa, Mirabel's older sister, appears to be losing her gift, to which Mirabel tries to find out how to fix this. To do so, she goes into her estranged Uncle Bruno's room for clues and discovers a vision showing herself to be the cause. Regardless, she still tries to do what she can, but ends up being caught out while trying to keep the situation a secret, while simultaneously ruining her eldest sister Isabella's wedding proposal. Mirabel then notices a figure within the walls of the house, her Uncle Bruno, who everyone believed had left as his visions brought nothing but misery for the family. He has actually been living within the walls of the casita this whole time, keeping watch over them because he still loves and cares for them. Mirabel convinces him to have another vision to see what will restore the family's miracle. This vision, however, unfortunately involves Mirabel hugging her sister Isabella. Who would have guessed? And she actually manages to do this, and it works! It turns out that Isabella never wanted to get married and resents having to be the family's perfect golden child, but she still loves them so she was still going to go through with it. As a result, Mirabel enables Isa to let loose for once and enjoy the feeling of freedom. After seeing Isabella seemingly acting out of control however, head of the family Abuela Alma then storms in and insists that all of the family's issues were in fact Mirabel's fault. An argument between the two ensues and the house falls apart, the family members all lose their gifts, and the candle representing the miracle goes out. Despite Mirabel's best efforts to save it, after this happens, Alma finds Mirabel alone beside a river where she finally tells the true story of how the family received the miracle. 
Alma and her husband Pietro were forced to flee their home with their three babies as the villagers were being pursued by violent rioters. Pietro sacrificed himself to save them, and it was then that the miracle manifested and protected Alma and her children. Alma apologises to her granddaughter, and the two finally manage to reconcile. They return with Bruno in tow to rebuild the casita, and now that the whole family have been brought back together and the casita is restored, the miracle returns. So that is our rundown of the story, and what we can glean from this is that the main themes revolve around family expectations, feelings of isolation, even among your loved ones, and generational trauma as a result of outside influences such as political unrest and violence. Especially for a Disney film, these are some very broad and difficult themes to properly navigate when it comes to a family-friendly demographic, but hey, they did it. And you can very clearly see why so many people have taken to this film compared to others such as Raya and the Last Dragon, for example. If you have never been made to feel like an outcast in your family or feel like you have certain expectations to uphold, you are very, very lucky. Everyone has something that their family expects of them or that they disapprove of, whether this is for you to be a doctor someday or that they disagree with your fashion choices. And because of this, it's also not hard to see why so many queer kids are gravitating towards it too, as those themes of feeling isolated and having expectations from your family, to be an example, can be very close parallels to how queer kids feel like they need to stay in the closet to be loved and accepted. I also thought that it was very commendable for Disney to not shy away from acknowledging Columbia's history of social unrest, as this is indeed something that would have a gigantic butterfly effect on these characters' lives, particularly Alma. The way these characters process this trauma and how it was passed down is probably one of the most realistic depictions of a family dynamic that I have seen in quite some time. While the exact time period is left intentionally vague, the film appears to draw inspiration from the events of the 1000 Days War in Colombia, which was a civil war that took place between 1899 and 1902. This war was directly responsible for the deaths of 100,000 to 150,000 civilians, and it resulted in whole villages having to uproot themselves to avoid the conflict. Considering that these events took place when Alma's three children were babies, we can safely assume that the film takes place in approximately the early 1950s. People are often very touch and go about whether they think fiction should incorporate such heavy themes and in what way, especially in kids' movies, which is understandable, but my take on that is if we don't do it, then our scope of entertainment would be so much smaller than it already is. Plus, these kinds of stories are a good way of helping people to understand the realities around them in a way that isn't too shocking. Reality can be scary and ugly, and you might want to run away from it, but I've found from experience that this often just makes dealing with it even harder, and that time to confront it will come eventually. Fiction can help us to face things, but not strictly as escapism. Fiction needs to be varied, and it needs to be something that carries themes that makes us uncomfortable in order to process them in a safe environment. And that is why scenes such as Alma's backstory are so important to keep in the film. There really aren't many Disney films that I can think of that not only acknowledge that these real-world events take place, but also manage to treat them with the appropriate amount of sensitivity that they deserve, while still keeping that balance of making the film easily consumable for children. The only other one that immediately comes to mind in regards to real events or figures is Mulan, the good one, not the live-action one, but even then, there are certain parts where the Huns were used for comedic effect, and also the film took some liberties in regards to Mulan's role in her own story, and even reportedly misrepresented the conflict between China and the Huns quite disproportionately in China's favour, though bear in mind the story is centred around a Chinese war hero, so that's kind of by the by. Oh, and there's also Pocahontas, but we don't talk about Pocahontas. But in essence, some people, most notably Colombians themselves, have noticed something that happens quite a bit with international audiences. Oftentimes, these wider audiences will home in on what they recognise or relate to and ignore the rest of the story's context. This isn't unusual, people always do this. People naturally gravitate to what they feel is familiar, but when you're doing that for films that are explicitly showcasing an aspect or something that is not often seen, this can come off as a tiny bit ignorant. And some people might try and use the excuse of, oh, but but it's Disney, it's supposed to be light-hearted, it's not that deep, it's supposed to be for everyone. And I agree, it is for everyone, but they wouldn't have included such a heavy scene if they didn't want you to talk about it. For example, let's say that two people, person A and person B, watch Derry Girls. Derry Girls is a teen comedy, but it also takes place during the Irish troubles of the 90s. Person A is Irish and has deep sentiments and feelings about the setting, while person B doesn't, but really homes in on the fact that Claire is a lesbian. And don't get me wrong, seeing a lesbian character growing up and navigating a Catholic girls' school in a country rife with conflict, in a time period where homophobia was much worse than it is now, is a kind of euphoria that I don't think straight people will ever understand, but I digress. Person A wants to talk about how the setting and being a part of Ireland and possibly growing up in this era affects them, and maybe feels that this could be an enriching learning experience for Person B, but Person B just continually brushes them off and only focuses on this one specific aspect and applies it to the way that they live that is far removed from the original setting, not taking into account 
account what led up to that reveal or what came after. And this causes person A to feel like there was no point in Derry Girls even having this premise in the first place if that's the only thing that people are going to be bothered about. It's basically the same thing happening with Encanto, except none of the Madrigal characters are even confirmed to be part of the LGBT community, which is arguably worse. For a lot of people, specifically Colombians and those of Latin American descent, it's a bit like how a bunch of millionaires completely missed the point of Squid Game, you feel me? As someone who has quite a big interest in world history, because I've always been interested in the world outside of this rainy, polluted little island, the aspect of learning about a whole new culture and what caused that place to become the way that it is has always been a huge draw for me when it comes to Disney films in particular. They were my window to the rest of the world growing up. As a result, I've never really understood those people who only gravitate to a certain type of film because, well, I don't want to be a bitch, but you guys are really boring. So while I'm not Colombian myself, this is why I felt it was worth bringing up. Not because I think people should prioritise one thing or the other, or because I'm trying to white knight or anything, but because I want to see more people sharing that enthusiasm. History can be so interesting and fun, and learning about the past can often help with navigating the future as well. But with that said, let's come back around and recenter on the topic of headcanons. Maybe in the future I'll make another video surrounding history about a certain thing, but we'll see. So what exactly are people saying about the characters? The main headcanons that people appear to be fixating on are that Camillo is gender non-conforming, Isabella is a lesbian, and Bruno is a gay man. There are a couple of others that I want to touch on as well, but basically I'm going to try to briefly go into how fans have interpreted these characters versus what the film itself seems to be trying to tell us about them. And I want to start by saying that all of these headcanons are valid, and there's no reason that they can't be true. The great thing about films is that you are free to interpret things in whatever way you like, within reason, but they are just that, headcanons. Nothing has been confirmed, and it probably won't be because it's Disney. Trying to get explicit LGBT rep from them is like squeezing blood from a stone for a number of reasons, and that's something we're all just going to have to come to terms with. So let's start with Camillo, arguably the fan favourite Magigal among the community. Camillo has the ability to shapeshift, and the people involved on the show even stated that he is still figuring out who he is, though this is spoken more of in the context of him being a teenager, more so than anything to do with gender, but people still chose to take that and run with it, which is great. An interesting part of his design is that his eyelids are noticeably dark, which leads a lot of people to believe that he is wearing eyeshadow, which also adds to the headcanon a bit more. A lot of non-binary individuals seem to really like him, which is a pretty natural progression for this type of character because he definitely carries a few tropes that have come to be telltale signs of characters with a loose relation to gender, the most prominent being, of course, the shape-shifting trickster. He's also just a very charming character in general, he's very mischievous and cheeky, but still very caring towards others and likes making people smile. Who wouldn't want to relate to a character like that? Within the film, though, it seems that every family member has a role to play in order to maintain their function and reputation, and in Camillo's case, it seems that he's been saddled with having to be someone else in order to be useful, and most of the time this involves him being an adult, and this is further emphasised when he starts to lose his gift and shapeshifts into a baby. While he doesn't tend to get a lot of screen time, he is seen shapeshifting into a mother at the beginning of the film to look after a baby while she takes a break. Camillo is basically being made to adapt into any situation where he is needed, and while he doesn't have the most screen time, I can personally imagine that this is a metaphor for how people try to mould teenagers into what the adults around them need them to be, rather than letting them naturally become who they want to be. And then we have Isabella. This is one that I'm kind of on the fence about, honestly, but a lot of people like to interpret Isa as being a lesbian, which, you know, I'm one of those, so I'm not complaining. But the issue with it is that people are only seeing this as a possibility because she didn't want to have what was basically an arranged marriage to a man she didn't love. Look, I think that she would make a fantastic lesbian. I've seen the fan art of her dating Elsa. It is very cute, but people can also just have a type or not want to be made to do something, and that doesn't mean that they want the opposite of that thing entirely. I've noticed this quite a bit with female characters who people head canon as lesbian in that they try to overachieve or be perfect in order to hide this secret attraction to girls, which in my mind tends to paint being lesbian as this inherently devious or dirty thing, which really isn't the case at all. I'm not saying that's the intent, but that's how I sometimes see it, and I know for a fact that I'm overthinking it because that's literally Surely what happens when you're part of a group that people sometimes like to give shit to. You just start to be sus of everything. Or maybe that's just me. I don't know. Isabella's role in the story was basically to be the family mascot. She represented the Madrigals as a symbol of perfection and was presented to the village, and more importantly, her fiancé Mariano's family as such. Because of this, she is not allowed to show imperfection, and this is shown in the scene where the family are sat eating and discussing her proposal. Abuela literally picks out one white flower in her hair after a dozen pink ones sprout up so that everything 
something matches. It's a small detail, but they add up, and it's later elaborated on in her song when she finally lets the perfect facade go. This is something that a lot of older siblings have to cope with, and the culmination of her outburst is a direct result of the pressure she puts on herself for the sake of her family. It's also worth noting that many have speculated that the reason Alma dotes on Isa so much is because she is the most visually identical to Alma when she was in her youth, and it's the same with Pedro and Mariano. So in a way, Alma is trying to live vicariously through Isabella by giving her the life she never had. And this is a very major symptom of generational trauma, having good intentions but enforcing them in a way that stifles people. Alright, let's talk about Bruno. So, a few people like to headcanon Bruno as a gay man, which honestly, aside from Camillo, I find this to be the headcanon with the most weight to it. When Bruno tells people the future, or if we want to be more technical, the truth, they get upset and this causes him to be outcast to the point where they condemn even the mention of his name. To be honest, this sounds so similar to the situation of a gay family member coming out and deciding to leave instead of be constantly subjected to toxicity that it's not even funny. Bruno is probably my favourite character because he's just a goofy uncle who cares about his family despite everything that he goes through, and when he finally stands up to Alma about the way she treats people, it's to defend Mirabelle, and it's honestly so sweet. That said, like every headcanon here that we're discussing, Bruno's identity is not intrinsically tied to queerness. The themes around his character are that of isolation, disappointment, and of people assuming the worst of you, and while we can see where the queer subtext comes from, it's more from a place of wanting to please people who are seemingly impossible to please at times. Also, I just want to address another type of headcanon, and it's the idea of Bruno having tics, such as knocking on wood or throwing salt. These are not tics. Bruno is a 50-year-old man living in the 1950s, in a country that is very, very Christian. These are superstitious traits, not autistic ones. Headcanoning every character that has a weird trait as autistic can come with its own set of problems. If you want to headcanon anyone as autistic, Dolores is right there. Also, does anyone think that Dolores' design would have been improved with a pair of earplugs? I think it would have visually emphasised a gift even more, I think. But, you know, that's just me. But anyway, let's move on to Luisa. I don't like this one, I'll just say right now. So apparently it's a thing that people are headcanoning Luisa as a trans woman, which is just so problematic on so many levels when it comes to fiction. For one thing, you're masculinising trans women who are already disproportionately mocked, slandered and discriminated against for just existing. And not only that, this implies that Luisa is strong because she has a masculine body, which goes against the theme of her character. A lot of the time, the kind of strength that Louisa is supposed to visually represent is psychological. The sibling that's always picking up the pieces, maintaining things, making sure everyone is okay. Louisa, I believe, is supposed to symbolise the often unseen strength and constant work that siblings are forced to adopt from a young age. I also find it ironic how everyone keeps thinking Louisa is the oldest, which is honestly the most middle child thing ever, and it just goes to show how underappreciated they really are when you think of it. You know that famous phrase, no one ever checks up on the middle child? Yeah, that's Louise's whole deal. Finally, due to having a rainbow patch on her shirt which is in the colours of the bi flag, people like to headcanon Mirabelle as bisexual, and that's really cute, it's a really nice concept. The idea of Mirabelle being different for this reason, if the Madrigals were to be a real family as opposed to a fictional one, makes a lot of sense, and it tracks with a lot of closeted kids, but it's important to remember that even if you find a lot of what she goes through relatable, her sense of individuality is not what drives her. The main conflict of Mirabelle's story is that she loves her family even if she feels a certain level of distance from them, and it's this struggle of constantly proving herself to a sometimes dangerous degree that drives a lot of her actions. Also, I want to say that even though I don't hate the the ending of the film and how the family reconciled so quickly, I feel like this would be a conflict of interest when it came to a queer kid's story. We all know that the road to acceptance isn't quite that easy for a lot of us, which is why it's important to remember that even though you might like the idea of Mirabelle being bisexual, Encanto is not about that aspect of her life. And I think that's all of the hair cannons we're gonna go over for now. What can I say, I'm a killjoy, shoot me. So, some final thoughts I want to bring up because I think they're important is that because of all these headcanons, what ends up happening in the fandom sphere is that people will then associate the solutions to such issues with the solutions that they have come to recognise as normal in their lives, and not necessarily what might apply within the setting of the story. Which is to say, many were not happy that Mirabelle forgave her grandmother so easily and wanted to entertain the idea of Mirabelle cutting her out of her life altogether, which I understand the thought process behind, and it would be interesting to see Disney tackle something like that in a film like this, but it would have been a terrible ending for the movie because the film as a whole is tied to the family being a close-knit unit with some realistic level of 
dysfunction. And the thing with Disney movies is that a lot of it thrives on the aspect of idealism, which is why it's such a big draw for people. Not only that, but these kinds of solutions are not always universal. You can't just tell a person from Japan to put themselves first and ignore what other people think of them, because Japan is not an individualist culture, and that goes for many other countries as well. I think in English-speaking countries especially, it seems so much easier to cut out toxic family members because our families are so much more distant and tend to keep to themselves, but that's not how things work everywhere else, and I think that's where a lot of the core problems lie, assuming that some things should apply in the same way that you know them to be. And that's definitely something a lot of us need to reflect on. It's not wrong to think this, but it's not always a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. So why does this matter? Well, I personally think it matters for the points I stated above, but I also realise that there are some things that I just can't fully reinforce because of who I am. This film is about a Colombian family and focuses on the experience and events witnessed by people living in that part of the world both past and present. This film is not about me, or people like me, and because of that I don't have that kind of familiarity backing me up. However, I am lucky enough to be acquainted with a wonderful little bean who is close to the heart of this wonderful place. This person is Lee Glem, also known as Leaf. Leaf is a Colombian artist who has kindly agreed to provide their thoughts on the film and on this overall subject. Leaf also happens to be the creator of the webtoon The Last Dimension, which is due to be re-released as a webtoon original. How amazing is that? Please, please give their comic a read if you haven't already and support them in any way you can, because they work so hard and deserve all the love in the world. I will be providing links to their Twitter and the canvas version of their comic below. So I asked Leaf a couple of questions such as if they liked the film, what they thought of the headcanons of some of the characters, and if they thought people who weren't affiliated with the culture were focusing more on that rather than using it as a learning experience. Which I just want to say again is not bad, don't feel bad for that, Leaf and I are not judging you, but it'll be interesting to hear what someone who's a bit closer to the setting might think of it. So here is what Leaf said. I loved the film, especially how well the Colombian rhythms were handled. It's a musical, a Colombian musical, and it portrays in every sense the Colombian aesthetic. I appreciated the details put into the dresses, the character designs, the little easter eggs that only Colombians or people who know the culture will get, and the visuals in general. The history behind the whole movie is a reality far too common, which extends from the time of our grandparents until our very time. It's ongoing and it destroys families and futures, and I'm very glad Disney didn't shy away from it. I love Camillo, I love him with a passion and I, as a non-binary myself, would see it as totally possible for him to belong to the LGBTQ plus community. Heck, he gives me gender envy. Isabella being a lesbian is something more of a stretch, not because she can't be, but because not wanting to marry doesn't make you a lesbian. I don't care about her orientation, I'm just happy for her. And it's okay to headcanon her as whatever orientation you wish, but the theme of the movie is not so much about people hiding their identity, but people dealing with expectations. I don't have access to all spaces and all conversations but I know people in Colombia are indeed focusing on the terrible history behind the movie, and others are criticising Pepper for being white. Can you please not? Siblings having different skin colours is so common here you'd be surprised. Or there not being any LGBTQ plus explicit confirmation. I agree that Disney can still improve on representation though. I think it wouldn't hurt to make more characters explicitly LGBTQ plus, and I understand that the headcanons come from the need to see ourselves in the movie. Headcanons are valid, and headcanons are okay. Yet the theme of the movie is not this. So people interpreting it as such is a bit tone deaf, and I'm not saying that to enjoy the movie you have to obsess about the story of forced displacement, violence, nationwide migration and so on that defines the socio-political landscape of Colombia, because in doing so we'd also be denying the theme of healing from that very trauma. I'm just saying, the Madrigal family was forced out of their home due to, in essence, political radicalism, and I personally think this is a very relevant topic to the world right now. The left against the right, willing to take arms and destroy those which don't stand by the same ideals. So no, it poses is no problem to find the representation we so desperately need, but it would be very appreciated if people would help to uplift the voices drowned by the violence. Those who are still trapped in other encantos, the small towns between the mountains or down in the plains, away from opportunities because their inhabitants are still hiding from the violence, or just from the trauma that runs from generation to generation. Every Colombian family has been touched by its history and its present, and I'm sure many other Almas, losing their loved ones, are living with the guilt of having survived. If you watch or re-watch the film, it's good to have in mind that although the miracle and the Casita are fictional, the Madrigal families exist, the Encantos aren't safe from violence, the death and despair that tear families apart still exist and still shape this country. Also, the Gabriel Garcia Marquez references and hints. <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda, you are amazing. Some of the voice actors in the Spanish dub are Colombian singers and famous actors. 
Thank you so much again for this leaf, you are a star. And it's not just leaf either who shares these sentiments. Take a gander at what people are saying on platforms like Twitter and TikTok, and you will see just how happy this film is making people. And it really is such a lovely thing to witness. It's a wonderful thing that so many people outside of the culture being portrayed are finding ways to relate to these characters and their situations, be it familial, identity-wise, or however else. But at the same time, we need to be respectful and help raise the voices of those who are the focus of the story and take care not to clamour over them. As Leaf said in regards to the political climate, the portrayal of such a struggle in the film is extremely important to show at this present time. The reason the 1000 Days War happened is because the ruling party of the time was suspected of rigging their elections, and this caused people to revolt the only way many without power know how, by causing havoc and chaos which unfortunately hurts innocent people 90% of the time before any kind of resolution is achieved. Many of the movements and struggles that we have experienced before and since then have also followed this pattern, and it's a very sad reality that generational trauma as shown through Alma is often one of the byproducts. But if there's one thing we can be thankful for, it's that humans are resilient, and we can find ways to move forward even through very rough times. And I think I have said enough. Thank you so much if you have made it to this point, and thank you again, Leaf, for providing the perspective on this topic. Encanto is a wonderful film. The hype and excitement and enthusiasm around it are a wonderful thing, so please don't let any of the things said in this video discourage you from partaking in that. Instead, allow yourself to celebrate other aspects of it as well. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you soon. Mantenerse seguros. Adios.